Let's take a look at an example of what the jury monad does for us when we apply it to a finite set. And the finite set that we'll look at is the set of points, the set of n points given by 0 through n. And in this case, Px, we can view as the set of probability measures on a finite set, and that's completely determined by a set of numbers that are all in Rn, so in other words, a vector in Rn, where each of these are greater than or equal to 0, and the sum of these numbers is equal to 1. Now what this looks like geometrically as a subset of Rn is exactly an n-simplex, whose vertices are given by these points, which we can view as the unit vectors in Rn. So this is an example of a 2-simplex, which is what we get when n equals 3. So this is a subset of R3, and these points are on the unit vectors in R3. So if I drew this as in being embedded in R3, I would have this line for the x-axis, this line for the y-axis, and this line for the z-axis, and 0 is somewhere drawn behind this simplex. Now, this tells us what it looks like geometrically as a subset of Rn, but we have to remember that the Px that we defined earlier has a specific measurable structure defined by the evaluation maps. When I say measurable structure, what I mean is the sigma algebra. It's determined by these evaluation maps that take subsets of x, and it evaluates measures on them. So take an element here, and we get some number between 0 and 1. So it takes a probability measure, which in this case is an element of this space, and we evaluate it on that measurable subset. In this case, it could be any subset of x. Now it turns out that this measurable structure coincides with the usual one as a subspace of Rn. So that corresponds to the Borel sigma algebra given by the standard topology on Rn. Now let's look at what that natural transformation from p squared to p gives us, the one that we denoted by b. So in this case, we have p squared x to px with our natural transformation bx. If we take a probability measure here, so this is a probability measure on probability measures, but a probability measure on this space is a probability measure on this simplex. Now where does that go to? Well, it gives us an element of probability measures on x, but as we know, an element of probability measures on x is a point on this simplex. So this is going to look like a point on this simplex. And what is the significance of this point and its relationship to the probability measure on this simplex? Well, if we look at the formula that we had before, we know that we can evaluate this on any measurable subset of x. But every measurable subset of x is determined by each of these vertices. In other words, each of these points. And so if we figure out what this is on each of the points, then we can figure out what the probability measure is everywhere. And so we can break it up into its different components. And therefore, this equals the first component is going to be bx of this probability measure applied to the measurable subset 0. And by the definition that we gave earlier, this is mu of the subset 0 and then we integrate with respect to this measure over the space of measures, which again are the elements of this simplex. And that's just the first component of this element, of this vector here. 
all the way up to px mu 1 dp mu. Now, what is this expression if we try to think about it um, more intuitively? Well, mu of 0, now mu is a probability measure on this space. So mu of 0 is just p0. It's the probability of 0. And p, oh sorry, this shouldn't say 1. This should say n minus 1. That's what that is. And this is pn minus 1. Now, if we look at what this is saying, oh, and if we think of mu as now being actually a vector, we'll just call it p instead, just so it's easier for us to understand what this element looks like. It's a vector in Rn. So this is an integral of the first component with respect to some measure. This is the integral of the last component with respect to that same measure. And when we put this all together, this is actually a vector of integrals. And what is that vector of integrals? It's exactly the integral of the vector p itself with respect to this measure. And px is the simplex. In other words, this expression, the natural transformation that we had from the Giry monad, gives us the Barry center of our measure of p, the probability measure on probability measures. So in this case, we have a probability measure on the simplex. We can compute the natural transformation applied to that probability measure, and it turns out that it is equal to the Barry center of that measure as viewed as a measure on this simplex. Now let's look at what the morphisms in the Claisley category associated to this jury monad look like. So if we take our space x, we can either think of this example or another more arbitrary one. And if we take a morphism in this Claisley category, let's call it f, then a morphism here takes us from x to the space of probability measures. Now, a map from here to here is measurable if and only if it's measurable with respect to this structure. But the measurable structure on here is determined completely by the evaluation on measurable subsets. In other words, it's measurable if and only if the composition of f followed by the evaluation on measurable subsets. In this case, we're dealing with um, probability measures, so I can just write 0 to 1 here. And what happens when I evaluate this measure uh, is measurable. And what happens when I evaluate this measure? This takes an element x, and it gives me f subscript x applied to e. Now, f subscript x is a probability measure on y, and this just evaluates that probability measure. Now, in order for this to be measurable, ah, for all measurable subsets, e in x, in y. Now, this is exactly the definition of a Markov kernel. In other words, a Claisley map associated to the Giry monad is exactly a Markov kernel. And now let's look at the composition. The composition of two maps, uh, and therefore we write this as, this is the notation from earlier. Now, imagine we have two maps like this. So given two Claisley maps, how do we take their composition? Well, the definition of the composition of Claisley maps is, I'm going to write these arrows backwards now so it's easier for me to view what this composition looks like. <coughs> 
So it's given by this composition. So first we apply F, then we apply the monad to G, and then we use the Berry center after we compose this composition to get a probability measure on Z. Let's see that this coincides with our definition that we gave earlier uh, when we basically integrate out the middle, middle guy, which is this space Y, and we integrate all, all of the probability measures. And we can do this in the example of finite sets if it's going to make it easier to visualize. So now let's see what happens when we pull through this composition. So if we start off with an element X, push it forward, we get a probability measure on Y. Now PG says take this probability measure and push it forward along the map G. So this is the push forward of the probability measure Fx. And then when you apply this here, what we're doing here is we're going to integrate this measure in the way that we've described earlier. So this is going to give us a new probability measure. For now, I'll just call it Bz g star Fx. Now, what is this measure evaluated on a measurable subset E? So if we take a measurable subset E by the very definition of what this is, is it's an integral over probability measures over Z. We're going to evaluate our probability measure given by this push forward. So we're taking this measurable function and we're integrating it with respect to this measure. Now, the change of variables theorem from calculus actually allows us to express this integral as an integral over y, the intermediary set in this composition. And this becomes evaluation on E precomposed with the associated measure obtained from this map G. That's exactly what the change of variables theorem tells us we can do um, from, you can think of it as from calculus, but you probably haven't seen it this way in calculus, but that's what the change of variables theorem tells us um, from analysis. Now, does this actually look like the formula that we had earlier? I think it'll help if we plug in one of the variables y here so that we can see what this actually looks like. So if we do that, if we plug in the integration variable, I've written these formulas without the integration variable, which is why it may seem a little bit strange. But if we put in that integration variable, then we get evaluation E. And we're computing, when we evaluate this at a specific element Y, we get a measure GY on Z. And when we evaluate that, well, that's just GY of E. And this is dfx, and our integration variable is y. So what does this look like when everything is a finite set? So in that case, the integral over y is a sum. And if we take e to be a very specific measurable subset, which is just a single point, we can take a single point in z, for instance, then what this gives us is a sum. So this is when x, when all sets are finite. So when all sets are finite and E equals the specific element Z, then this gives us a sum over all elements in Y. That's what this integration procedure is doing. The value of Fx on that element Y, well, our notation for that was F subscript Yx. And then here we have G subscript Zy. So it gives us exactly that formula that we had for the composition of stochastic maps, but now it's much more general in, in the context where you can have any measurable spaces whatsoever. And this shows us that the composition in the Claisley category reproduces the ordinary composition of stochastic maps.